Welcome everyone to our third part. We're all uh, on healing the racial divide. It's very exciting uh, as Kathy sees so many of you here and interested in this topic. And so I just really welcome everyone. And I hope that you are finding these series really informative and beneficial and um, just a couple of things. We um, just a, a reminder that this is a healing circle, and we're just uh, not really wanting to go into process per se. But of course, you to have your uh, feelings of deep experiences, and um, we're also just trusting in people's basic goodness and their heartness and and values. We also agreed that we felt um, not using the chat room unless you have specifically a technical issue is a good thing because it's really hard to really take in everything that um, the speakers sharing and also having part of your attention go to the chat room. It was also very hard for us. So we ask you unless you really have a technical problem to, um, to not uh, chat. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patricia. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, every hi everyone. Welcome back to the Healing the Racial Divide series. Um, it's good to see all of you. Last week, you were giving a lot of information to think about. I appreciated all the thoughtful questions for the panelists. And as I mentioned before, the intention for the, ser for the series is to share with you a lot of information so that you can explore these issues further, deepen your own knowledge and skills, and go out and do the important work of creating more justice in the world. Our esteemed faculty panelists today are Ada Robinson. Ada is a former year one teacher. She's the founder and director of the Village of Natural Teaching, a 20 year living foods lifestyle practitioner and trainer, and the journey through consciousness workshop leader. She's also an ordained So, okay. Therefore, uh, and I'll hand it over to you, Ada. Kathy Bauer is the current dean of Year One. Okay, so I'm, I'm sure that I'm cutting in and out right now. So I'm trying to make sure that, are you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> are you ready for me to start? Hello? Hello? I think Patricia might be cutting in and out. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. Did it's she? It's Patricia. Okay. Okay. So did she, I didn't hear her either if she told me I needed to start or. I wasn't sure if we got to introduce Kai. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't think I hurt anyone other than myself, so I'm not sure what's happening to you. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> yeah, Ada, Ada kind of stopped after you. So I think we're all on the same page that we're missing still the introduction of the other panelists. Right. Okay, so um, I'll just finish up here. I got disconnected for a minute. The that be okay? Is that um, Haruna Suma, 
was in psychology, as well as marriage and couples. He is senior faculty and is currently dean of four. Kao is the current dean of year one in the yeah. California school. His teaching includes being a senior teacher in shamanic personal transformation and Okay. So uh, Kaz, have you are we ready? It's not. I think Patricia she just continues to have the the in and out. So maybe it would be smart, Ada, for you to just get started. So she'll have some time to get that figured out and then could introduce people right before they speak. You know what I mean? Because you're loud and clear. So she just needs to get her connection straight. Okay. Well, I just like to say good evening to all of you. And uh, this evening, what I am going to be talking about is something that most of us think we've dealt with, and that's fear. And most of us got unresolved, unrevealed fear in our consciousness. And that consciousness keeps us being afraid of each other. So one of the most important things mm -hmm. is to meet that fear. And most times we don't meet it because it serves a purpose. And we, I would like each of you just to relax into yourself and kind of look inside of yourself and meet that fear as I take you through the beginning of this fear because when we came together, we came together as sisters and brothers. We, when man first put his feet on this soil in, the, in this country and began to accumulate by pushing, because that's the nature of man, pushing the Indians into little tribes, which cause division. And most times the origin of fear is in conquer, divide and conquer. Fear is there to keep separation and it's utilized by man. If you are in one class where you got money, you got the things you need, you are not a lot of people. So during the 1600s, and I'd like you to just feel what I'm about to share with you. In the 1600s, when they needed workers to work the tobacco fields, man went and brought people in, having them sign an agreement that they would work free for them for seven years in order to receive uh, a piece of land and a new home. And all of these people were the low class as they were labored. They didn't have homes. They didn't have places to live. They were hungry. So they on this land and they are fine. There wasn't any other people other than the natives. But in 1676, when they discovered that the people they were bringing in were dying, they had an expectance of two years they needed. So money and man got greed slipped in and they start to bring people from 
Africa. They brought them all and they were together because they were the people that had nothing. They, they joined together, they lived together, they ate together, but it became a big group of people. And those rich owners decided that we need to split these people up because they are going to overthrow us and take what we have. So they decided by 1681 to give dominion and authority to the white uh, people of that class and take away everything that the black people of that time had, everything. So they put them in a place of fear because you got the white with a fear. They fear now because now they have a house, they have a little piece of land, they have some money. Not a lot, but they have some money. So now I don't want you to have my stuff, so I'm not going to, I'm going to do what I have to do to keep you where you are. So that is the beginning of fear, deep-seated fear, passed down generation after generation. And both set of people have fear. There's fear that you're going to take my stuff. You're going to move into my neighborhood. You're going to come to my school and my children won't have anything. Then you have the fear of the black mothers and fathers. They're gonna separate me from my children. My children, I need to be able to feed and clothe them. This has permeated fear and it's in your system. It's not going anywhere. So in order to change, we have to meet that fear. And that fear is some of the worst pain you ever had. Feel yourself as a black person. No place to live and if I Yo, you have dominion and authority over me, so you are not even going to give me food. If I try to get away, you will kill me, kill my children. So black parents have been concerned about their children ever since they entered this planet. And on this, this country, in this country, when, I, when a woman gets ready to have a baby and it's a little black baby, her heart is surrounding that baby. I have lived, I came in during the, uh, what uh, some call the Jim Crow area. I had pain when my grandmother, <clears throat> excuse me, had to stand while half the bus had seats that were empty. Think about your grandmother. What do you want for her? So I was very disturbed. And as I grew up, Okay, I want you to feel wanting to read, wanting to be able to do better and have someone say, shut up, little girl, you can't read. Those things are painful and you uh, have pain because your pain is to keep someone from taking what you have. 
but my pain come from wanting to have the things I need. You walk into a job and you look around and everybody look different from you. Everybody has things and stuff and a place and all you want to do is to be a part. And everybody looks and refuses because they don't want you to have their stuff. We live in this society with children that are growing up. And I am so thrilled because my young black friends and brothers and sisters refuse to step back. I've had to refuse to step back and take different directions because I'm not good enough. How do you feel that you could handle your student when they come in your classroom unless you get to know them? I don't mean <clears throat> having to be able to say, okay, I have some friends that are black. I know this one. I did this. That's not getting to know me. That's not getting to know a black person. I believe that when we visit this unrevealed fear, we have to do it afraid. We have to look around and spend some time getting to know people by just being with them. But when someone says to me, what can I do? I can't tell you what to do. You have to decide if you want to give up your privileges because back there in the 1600s through the, uh, when they had <clears throat> these slaves, some of those people were friends, but they didn't want to give up their privileges so they couldn't speak up. Think about how many times somebody has, have re, you have reviewed or seen or been involved in something where someone was doing something inappropriate to another person. How did you handle that? During lynching, when they were lynching people, every, oh, that's a shame. But you didn't do anything. <clears throat> That's no different from having your knee on my neck. It's no different. We have to truly decide where we want to be. And especially if you call yourselves healers and teachers, which we all do, we have to be ready for this ride. It is not easy. It's not easy to change. It's not easy for me to trust you when you're white. <clears throat> Why? You haven't done anything right now, but you're white. And it's not easy for you to trust me. But we will say, Oh, I love you. You're my friend. As long as it doesn't interfere with the things that you have to do, you have to go inside and know that. As long as I don't want a job like you, a house like you, so those are things we have to look at and we have to, before we step into these shoes, we need to know, can I handle this? Can I be this? Because when you step in there, it's 
mucky. <coughs> yeah. Excuse me, it's mucky. It's ugly. And sometimes when you get through it, you can feel such loving satisfaction for individuals when you see the change. But you have to be willing to do it afraid because that unrevealed fear is going to always pop up in your face to take away and to keep you in separation. Fear has its origin in divide and conquer. So remember, you have to make that decision yourself. Am I going to allow my privileges or my non-privilege to stop me from living my best life? And you, when you do something to help another, to benefit another, that's when you live in your best life. But if you never do it, you won't have a clue of what's being missed. And knowing each one of you that are here, that you are here because you have decided somewhere in your consciousness, some of you decided, I want to make a difference. And some of you may be here because you want to see if this is something you want to do. Wounding happens. Rewounding happens. When you start down a journey and you are not authentic. So be sure you check yourselves to see and feel if this journey that you are on right now is for you. And thank you. Thank you. Mark. Um, my computer is wonky today, but um, I'll quickly introduce our next uh, speaker. Uh, is the current president of the Brennan Bull. Held in position in the schooling part, has a energetic therapist and has completed the neuro effective relational. She's being certified in functional medicine. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Um, wow, thank you, Ada. That was uh, very powerful and um, deeply moving. And I'm changing my presentation up just a little because I, I feel like uh, listening to what you were sharing, um, one of the things that I did want to presence is um, the characterological model that we, and um, where we can think about it in terms of childhood trauma. It, it's also what we carry into uh, adulthood. And, and they're, they're the needs not only of the child, but also of the human being. And what I would like to do is start by presencing those and then really, sorry, I'm probably gonna start crying and also just really feeling how for the, every single one of those has been systematically denied, 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 denied. Um, <clears throat> 
So um, I'm going to be uh, presencing them by the, the, the need that uh, the child and then also the adult has. So the first one is the need for safety, the need for feeling welcome, and the need for belonging. The second one is the need for nurturance, both to have our physical needs met and to also have our emotional needs met. The third one um, is about freedom. We need to be able to experience our freedom. We need to be able to experience our autonomy. One is we need to be able to trust. We need to be able to feel that there's situations where we can just surrender. And then the, the last one is we need to feel that we can be authentic. And when we look at these needs, we can see again that the Black have been systematically denied every single one of these needs throughout history. And sorry painful and so I just would like to presence them and I'm sure that um, you know that um, Ada and Haruna and Patricia can presence them much more than I can but um, I would like to presence them so how do, would it feel to feel that you do not have safety that you could go out and for no reason be murdered and feel that you would be systematically not allowed in certain neighborhoods, not allowed in certain schools as Ada is so beautifully presenced. And how does it feel that your physical needs, your emotional needs are not going to be met? We know that the black families, uh, you know, different statistics, but are, um, twice as likely to be living in poverty. We also know that their black freedom and autonomy is greatly restricted as Ada has presence, not feeling free to, you know, walk into a grocery store or to, um, you know, to go jogging. So, you know, oh, you look suspicious or you're wearing a mask, you look suspicious. And so all of these ways where uh, freedom and autonomy has been taken away, being able to trust. It's so sad that, you know, um, the sharing that uh, the Blacks have to give this talk to their children about how to act uh, in case they're pulled over or in, in case this happens or that happens and how they have to accommodate themselves to a white world. And then authenticity. Yes, I mean, it's the same thing. How have they been denied their authentic voice? And, uh, you know, again, how we haven't listened. So it's all very painful. <laughs> And so I wanted to just presence those. Um, I know that uh, in the beginning, the, this lecture series was talked about in terms of energy medicine. I, I just also want to make sure that we're common ground that, that when we say energy, that we're also speaking about consciousness. Those two are inextricably intertwined and that's why at the school we teach both healings and uh, psychological work so that they can work together and whenever we have an energy block there's also a, a corresponding um, presentation in our consciousness of a limited belief system uh, or, or basically a fragmentation. So uh, I just wanted to presence that, that sometimes we might be referring to the energy field and other times, uh, as I was just sharing, although it affects the energy field, I was uh, presenting more, you know, the, the consciousness aspect. And 
I did want to share one other thing um, about the ACEs study. I don't know how many people um, know about that study. Um, I find it very, uh, very profound. Um, the, the ACEs study, ACEs is an acronym for adverse childhood experiences. And it didn't actually start out as that study. It actually was a, a weight loss study from Kaiser Permanente. And we're having a lot of dropouts from this weight loss program. And they went back and interviewed um, the participants that had dropped out. And they found that there were so many uh, of them that had these adverse childhood experiences. And I'd like to just uh, uh, read some of these uh, things that would qualify. So physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, exposure to domestic violence, household substance abuse, household mental illness, parental separation or divorce, an incarcerated household member. And for me, what was, uh, well, there were that were profound about the study, but what was profound is for the first time, people were were applying the study to so many different systems. People were looking at, you know, wow, these, these experiences are affecting people's individual health. They're affecting their emotional well being. And from there, they're also affecting our society. And so um, it's sad to say that one study said that 60% of black children have experienced ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. And so um, I think it's just holds a space for us um, to really realize how profound uh, have been affected by, by the systemic oppression that has gone through our society. And one of the things that I really loved about this study is that Oprah Winfrey did a presentation on it. And she said, by the way, that this was one of the most profound stories, if not the most profound story she'd ever done in her whole life. Because again, the impact of how we as individuals that moves out into society, because we know that we're not, uh, we're not just our individual energy field. I mean, with technology, we are interfacing with these larger energy fields that are um, affecting us in, in very profound ways, as we saw when we witnessed the murder of George Floyd. But the real thing that she said, and I say that about the energy fields, I'm saying that, but, but what she said that I really loved was she said that it had completely changed her point of view, so that when she had problems with a person, instead of saying what's wrong with that person, she said, I wonder what happened to that person. And just take these two different statements. I mean, one of the things that we teach in school, one of our psych spiritual schools is contact. And at the first uh, connection, it's about, you know, yeah, how do you contact with yourself, with just yourself? But that statement, what's wrong with you, it's, it, it, it's only reflective of what, myself is feeling and it's also reactive and blaming and judgmental and the other statement i wonder what happened to you or in my words i love i wonder what their story is it changes the dynamic of something instead of being reactive to being in relationship being an i thou 
connection with another person that feels open and feels compassion. And indeed, studies do show that that if someone has done uh, a, a certain deed uh, that's presented to a participant in a study and they show it with no but then if they show it with an explanation that, you know, oh, this person's uh, grandmother is dying or whatever, the, the, the review of that person is so much more favorable because that's, we hear their story. And so I feel that there's so much healing uh, present when, when we begin to learn the stories in more detail. And the last thing that I presence um, is something that Barbara Brennan said from Core Light Healing. I, I think it's, I'm, I'm just going to mention it, and I think it holds great potential for healing. Basically, she said that when a child experiences trauma, they hold their breath, and it's a freeze reaction. And then what happens is that the, the energy of the feeling separated from the energy of the thought and a block is created as well as, you know, a corresponding um, belief system in that person's consciousness. And, and then it's only until these two, the feeling and the thought, can come back together that there can be a healing resolution. And so I hold that as a possibility with time and space and patience that we can move forward to, you know, to healing the racial divide. And um, so thank you for listening. And I'm going to turn it back over to Patricia if she's able to get on. Thank you so much, Lisa, um, for, your, for your presentation. Um, we're Moving now to Kathy Bauer. Um, Kathy is the current Dean of Year One in the BBSH California School. Kathy's teaching experience also includes being a senior teacher in a shamanic personal transformation and training program. Kathy. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you, Lisa. Yeah, I definitely can feel a lot of pain in my heart by all that you've shared, like people just needing to meet their real needs and how that gets interrupted based on these systems of racial injustice and oppression that are so pervasive in our country. And so I'm aligned in my heart with you and with Ada and everybody else that showed up today to try to make a difference in our communities and across the world. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing a presentation that is mostly based on Barbara's latest book, Core Light Healing. And there's a huge amount of information uh, that Barbara has shared. And I also wanna honor Lisa Van Osteren as the senior editor of that book. And so there might be some pieces that you hear through my presentation that are coming through the brilliance of Barbara Brennan and Lisa Van Ostren, and I'm blessed to be able to receive their teachings. And I'm very happy to share them with you. So I'm going to start to share my screen. And so um, my presentation is about using energy healing to help break out of the vicious cycle of white privilege and systemic racism. And all of us on this panel and all of us uh, in our hearts where we meet here, I am assuming that each one of you who showed up on this call also are joining us with the intention to stop 
this vicious cycle of white privilege and systemic racism. And uh, my prayer is that we will have the courage to meet everyone in their needs in a way that really supports equality and justice for all. So what does it mean to embody that Black Lives Matter? And these are just a few bullets, but feel into that question for yourself. If you're showing up for this transformation in the world, what does embodying Black Lives Matter, what does that mean for you personally? Uh, for me, it means centering Black voices and culture really giving the microphone over to um, black people. I even hate using the terms black people, white people, but that's kind of what we need to do right now in this day and age. And hopefully over time, uh, we can do it without all of the edges that come along with uh, speaking it. But um, in any case, really centering black voices and culture uh, I remember from the first panel, they talked about how, how much we lose when we don't have diversity in cultures in these conversations. And we do, we lose so much. Um, opening our eyes and hearts to the deep pain and suffering endured by Black people. And it, it's completely heartbreaking. And especially uh, for myself and for white people, you know, we really need to expand and deepen our capacity to be with the realities of their experiences and to be able to hold a container to meet them in all of the ways that they're disregarded or limited or their freedoms are taken away. Or in the case of George Floyd, their life is taken away. We got to take a stand. We got to take a stand and say no more. And then um, dismantling racist systems of oppression and creating sustainable transformation in our communities. And that means equal human rights, equal opportunities for all, restorative justice, among many other things. And these systems of oppression have been going on for over 400 years in our country and even longer all around the world. So I know we're a group of powerful people and I put my confidence in us aligning with this task. I think that these are the times and we are the people. If we can bring all of our intention and energetic power to this, I, I stand on the ground that we can make a difference. And then of course, educating and modeling anti-racism and connecting with our spirit uh, you know, our unique essence inside to help show us the way, connecting with our higher ancestors who live those traumas, they want something better for us. I've talked to them all the time. And we can call in our spiritual allies to help guide us. And it's really this process of, you know, opening our hearts and being inclusive. All voices are welcome here in this territory. And we also, we need help from the higher spiritual guides. So opening our hearts up to the pain, opening up our hearts to listen to spiritual guidance in whatever ways it comes through to us so that we can receive what our individual pieces are to take these next steps in really um, stopping stopping and dismantling these systems of racial oppression. And from here, um, I'd like to ask for Randall's help. I'd like to play this video. And Randall, we're gonna stop the video on the credits of this amazing spoken word artist. Like I'm, he just deeply touches my heart and soul. And then uh, I'll take then once we, you know, just pause a couple of seconds on his name, then I'll go back to my slide presentation.
I'll stop my share. Just, and it's Ryan. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, 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 here we go. Shops have been looted in a sixth night of unrest. Parliament streets anything but quiet tonight with more peaceful protest money. Is it really not enough for the voter to fly? When the world is enraged from watching a black man die. Gasping for breath, and the man says, I can't breathe, with his esophageal tube collapsed under a man's knee. Is it not enough to wake in the wake of hate perpetuated by a system dating back to Negro slaves? Beat that black man, make him pick cotton, shoot that black man, he looks like he's up to something. Is the American fury not enough for you? Crowds plowed through by vans driven by the men wearing blue. Who do you call when the cops are the killers? When the body camera footage shows me you're killing brothers and sisters. Is the execution of a man, is that not enough for you? Judge, jury, and execution by a man dressed in blue. You look down at us for behaving like an angry mob. If all men are created equal, what gives you the right to play God? Where is the leadership? Where is the fight? Four days to be arrested for murdering a man in plain sight and a nine-day riot to arrest the three. Right? Did it maybe occur to you that our hearts are broken, that we're tired of being hurt in our culture not moving forward? Be it Selma. Malcolm X, the death of Dr. King, Freedom Riders' bloody Sunday, I can hear the choir sing, Rosa Parks, the LA riots, the beating of Rodney King, Eric Gardner, Philando, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, can you feel the sting? You'll arrest hundreds of young minds and voices of the generation to come, but all you had to do was give us justice for one. Now you've created a resentment that will stretch a generation that will instill fear in the police administration in the eyes of the young people who know what is right. Trusting in the biblical law of thou shalt not kill. Right. Aren't you just tired of the pain? The anguish and the struggle. Aren't you tired of the fear, disdain? <laughs> and anger for one another. Aren't you tired of the intimidation, the injury, and the judgment? Do I look infected to you because I'm not white? Do you see me as evil without blue eyes in my sight? Am I not human? Do I not walk upright? So why do you beat me? Why do you shame me? Why do you draw your weapons on sight? Police, get your hands in the air! Get the fuck down! Yes. Officer, yes. I said, get the fuck down. I'm talking to you. The man representing the red, white, and blue. For the broken eye sockets and the rubber bullet concussion, tear gas and billy clubs inciting more violence. Yet another reason to protest. 
get another reason to scream. Trace it back to the slave days and everything in between. The looting and the destruction is a side effect of our scream. The world protested. Marched and we cried, stop the racism, please make police brutality die. And this isn't just for black folks. This is for all of humanity. So we can live in a country where we can feel protected and free. Is it not enough to see a black man shot in the back? Running from a man in a badge with his Glock pistol cocked back. Ticking time bomb has exploded and we can't afford to wait and see if justice will be served or will be another black man hanging from a tree. Volcanoes must erupt to create new land and sometimes violence is the answer to a heavy opposing hand and the fire and brimstone evoke justice in a conversation and so now I pray quietly for an answer to the situation. I have hope that humans will pass this social test. Because I'm not sure that the world can handle another collapsed neck. So just take a moment to feel the emotions, the thoughts that came through you during that presentation. You know, we really learn so much from the cultural creatives, the artists in the world. They have a way of speaking truth. And so I really want to honor him for this deep and powerful and beautiful work. And I hope that um, spoken word documentary is watched around the world. So I'm going to be sharing my screen again, and uh, there's so much information in this presentation, and uh, I'm not going to cover everything, but know that you can go to Core Light Healing and continue to uh, read and study the information, and there's Core Light Healing online workshops, and of course, we go in-depth at the school in working with this material. Okay, I'm going to start to share. So as many of the graduates and the students of this school know, um, Dr. Barbara Brennan developed the energetic model of the four dimensions of humankind. And we were relatively familiar with our physical body. And then there's these deeper energetic dimensions to us that we keep deepening into in our process of self-discovery. Of course, most of you here on the call have heard of the aura. Uh, Barbara refers to it as the human energy field. And all of our thoughts and emotions and all the aspects of our personality are contained within the human energy field. And the aura is a dimension deeper than the physical body. And so it's a template for the physical body. And now if we were to go to the next deeper dimension, it's Hara. And Hara is the dimension of intention. And uh, this place is, uh, it's really intention. It's not about emotions. It's just pure, clear intention. And when you're in the process of creating something new, getting really clear with your intention is critical for that. And then a dimension even deeper. So oh, I want to go back. The dimension of Hara supports the aura. And so when we want to create something energetically, we'll be going through all these dimensions. And so from Hara, if we want to go a dimension deeper, we go into the core star dimension. 
And that's where we experience our core essence. That's the place where we are one with the divine, with source, with God, with great spirit, whatever is your spirituality, that place where we are one and in unity. And as we're facing this crisis of human evolution right now, uh, most of our answers are gonna be coming through this core essence, this place that knows where we can be united together. And so creating space for this manifestation process that starts in this core essence place, you can get there through uh, meditating or using your intention just to connect with this deepest part of your inner light and expanding that through your body and field. And then you bring that essence into your hara line. What intentions do you have? I want to stop systemic racism and I want to create a new world with equal opportunity for all. And then we work on our human energy field to clear all of the blocks that impede uh, our manifestations so that it can come through the way that we are envisioning it and the way we're walking for this new way to manifest in physical form here on earth. So that's the creative process through the model that Barbara talks about. So how do we work with the four dimensions of humankind to break out of systemic racism? And uh, as I mentioned, your creative process is initiated in your core and you're drawing up that creative power from source. And this is our first individualized uh, energy as it comes through the core star is our core essence and it contains all of our core qualities, all of our unique gifts that we came into this world to share. And so you connect with your core essence to cope, open up your conscious awareness to new possibilities that reflect wholeness and wellness for all. And you infuse that conscious awareness of new possibilities from the core star dimension into the Hara dimension. And so continuing in the Hark dimension, again, it's the dimension of intentionality. And there's three really important points along this Hara line. This first one up here is called the individuation point. It looks a little bit like an upside down ice cream cone. Um, that is the spot where we initially come through, where we connect with our our individual reason for being here on earth. It connects with our life purpose, why we wanted to have this experience in physical form. And that's where we align with our life purpose. The second spot is called the soul seat. And it's a place that's on our sternum and it's just a little bit below like three fingers below the clavicle. And when you touch it, like you can imagine, it's a spot where a lot of times when I go, oh, it's like my hand just naturally goes to that spot because it really touches me. And often it's called the high heart. And this is on the energetic dimension of this Hara line. So if we consciously spend time here and let that light in our soul seat expand, for me, it's like my inner compass. It helps me to connect with what are my deepest longings right here, right now on earth? And what do I want to manifest in my life, uh, aligned with my life purpose? And then the second spot, which is called the Dantian, and it's about uh, you know, an inch and a half below the belly button, a little, little bit lower for some people. And this is the part, place of our personal power. And it's a ball of light. And if we just conscious awareness with our intention, bring our breath into that, we can start to expand that personal power and how it is centered within us and supports us for what we want to create in our world. And of we want to just keep centering within that. And then as we connect to the uh, Dantian, deep into the crystalline core of the earth, 
then we can bring up the earth's energies to support the manifestation of our intentions through this heart dimensions. It's, these are all master level skills and each one of you are deepening into your ability to masterfully co-create with the universe. Oops, wrong one. And the next is the aura dimension that Barbara refers to as the human energy field. Uh, as each level of the human energy field corresponds to different aspects of the creative process. And I'm not going to go through all of those right now, but you can read about those levels in Hands of Light, which is Barbara's blue book. Um, and it talks about, as, as Lisa mentioned, real needs. We have real needs on each of those levels of the human field. And we want to really be conscious and develop practices that help us to clear our energy field, um, to make sure that there aren't any blocks impeding what we want to manifest and create here on earth. And um, there's lots of uh, wellness practices, including physical exercise, uh, working with uh, somatic body centered therapy or doing Bren Brennan integration work with your BIP or energy exercises like color breathing or Dantian ground. Um, all of these chakra spin is one of the best on the auric level. Um, praying, praying, connecting with the higher spiritual levels of your field asking for guidance, asking for them to show you the way, helping you to create a path for yourself and for others that's aligned with the highest good for all. And continuing to open from source to those spiritual teachers. The, the auric dimension is um, a dimension deeper than the physical dimension. So and it, it includes all of the consciousness of our personality. So it includes all of our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions. And so it's a really important part of our, you know, our holistic being to tend to, especially if we want to live, uh, as Ada put, our best life. And if we want to help support others in living their best life. And then of course the physical dimension. And as we're going through the manifestation process, everything shows up in those deeper dimensions first. And it takes the longest to manifest in the physical dimension. But one of the things that you can do to support your creation is to keep bringing in the visceral experience of the feelings of the new creation as if it's already here. And it's already manifested through you, your group, and throughout the world. And seek evidence for that out in the world. Like for me, seeing everybody on this call, 138 people aligned to create a healthier system for all of society, just melts my heart. And it really reflects, as Barbara says, that if you are starting to see it like we are here now today, it means it's already in its manifestation process. So let yourself take that in in this moment and to feel it. It's already beginning to happen. And I don't want to be kumbaya pal Pollyanna about it. There's a lot of hard work that needs to happen. But let the fuel of today, let the fuel of the kindness and, you know, the work of Black Lives Matter uh, be evidence that something is taking shape here in physical form. And then lastly, uh, for yourself, identify practical steps you can take on the path of manifesting um, the new creation from your unique gifts. And so I'm, yeah, I will go ahead and speak to this. I think it's important and it touches a little bit about on what Ada spoke to and Lisa, but 
each of us going along in life, we have wounds that are held in energetic blocks in our human energy field, but they're, they're not triggered in the moment. I know mine are often triggered and certainly walking with this past of this path of what's happening right now. Um, when we're, when we're walking around in the wholeness of our field that includes all of the blocks of our wound, Barbara would call that imbalanced homeostasis. It's imbalanced because there are blocks in our field, but it's homeostasis because we're not reactive and it hasn't been triggered. And so all of those thoughts, all the, all the beliefs, all of the emotions aren't activated. So I have the appearance of being calm even though I, I walk every day in my life with uh, these woundings and, and blocks within my field. So knowing that, just take a moment and let's just honor, in the United States, black people have experienced over 400 years of racial trauma. So just imagine 400 years of racial trauma being in your field. And even before conception, communication between parents and incoming baby starts through energetic relational cords. So I just think about how courageous those beings were to come into earth at this horrific, at the, during this horrific 400 years. And trauma is carried down to us in the human energy field through our traditional ancestral roots. And I'm not going to be going into detail about those, um, but they are roots that connect us with our ancestors. And sometimes there are lineage pieces that come through those uh, roots that in some cases support us and in some cases may not be supporting us today. And those roots, like they maybe it's around issues of, you know, how to keep safe and they were able to keep safe, but maybe some traumas happened. And so they might be passing around or passing down a fear that um, it's not safe or to be cautious or be on guard. And we all have these um, tra traditional ancestral roots. And sometimes, too, it can be through um, a religious hold that comes down through the lineage piece. And they're asking us to you know, follow within that religious lineage. And in some cases, that's a beautiful gift. And in some cases, it may not serve us for our work in the world today. So... Um, you can read more about that in Core Light Healing. And then also the DNA in the cells of our body that contains um, the instructions for how we're building our body. And those instructions uh, come and they can be, they can have and receive an impact from trauma. And so there's adaptations to the genes that occur through the years and through the lineage. And so um, the impact of trauma lives in each of us in each cell of our body through the DNA. And as embryos in the womb, our physical bodies are created through these four dimensions of humankind and the DNA in the cells, which holds the cellular memory of trauma and fear through our lineage. So as we incarnate and grow from an embryo in the room, in the womb, uh, through childhood to adulthood, we internalize the fears and beliefs of ancestors, family members, authorities in our life, um, and also from personal experiences living in a hostile environment. And this is all within the human energy field. And then an event happens to activate the wounding in our energetic blocks. And so one of the questions that Patricia had posed to us was, what does the human energy field look like when it's impacted by racial trauma? And you can see those little darker spots. It's lower frequency energy that's kind of congested. 
And those are areas of our life, which is um, based on where the levels of the field are. Those represent levels of our life and different expressions in life. And that's where our energy gets frozen, as Lisa said, with the emotions and the thoughts that happened when we held our breath and we stopped being on our natural life force uh, within our life. And so our life, part of our life force remains stuck and separate in those energetic blocks and not fully available for what, to, what we want to create. And so sometimes as a result, actually I would say many times, our creations cannot be completed because of these blocks for various reasons, or they might get created, but they're not quite what we were looking for. And so that's why we really want to tend to our energetic field to help uh, receive support for clearing those blocks so that we have a clear field through which we're manifesting what we want to create in the world. And so I'm just going to move very quickly through this, but this is a, a depiction of the block, which there's two, there's two blocks here. There's one in this third chakra and there's also a one in the heart area as well. But you can imagine like with the death of Mr. Floyd, how uh, you know we all had an impact of watching his murder on screen. And so our energy field gets activated and whatever woundings had occurred in the center of those blocks, they get activated and that energy starts to move around. And then we start to, have those thoughts. I'm not safe in the world. I can't trust others to keep me safe. And, you know, that was true based on the timing of when the experiences happened that created these blocks. And it's true now with the death of Mr. Floyd. Um, but it doesn't have to be true for all of our future going forward. And then at the same time, the emotions held in the wound are released, like fear, sadness, grief, anger, rage, you name it. And then hark distortions. Um, if there's a distortion in your hara, you will split your creative force according to that distortion. This is called split intentions. And examples of potential impact of white privilege on the hara include uh, colluding with white supremacy and systems of racial injustice because you benefit from them. Like just feel into that. I can feel into all of the white privilege and benefits I've received from that throughout my entire life. And so I, I know each one of us spiritually is being called to stop these systems of uh, suprem white supremacy and racial injustice, but we have to get really clear about that intention um, because otherwise we might stay silent when we observe racist behavior or we um, are part of systems that are uh, supporting the status quo. I mean, we can't keep things going on in the status quo and really facilitate the level of change that's needed right now. And then and the third, the last point here is not taking action to create the change you want to see in your community. And, you know, there's been this expression, I don't know who coined it, but silence is violence. And I would also say inaction is violence as well at this stage of humanity's evolution. We need to come forward holistically with all of who we are to change the life that we live in. And so I'm noticing the time and I know that it's going through, um, I'm starting to come to the end of my timing, but I just want to go through and support, you know, how do we, how do we individually each support the change and internally um, energy is consciousness as Lisa said, and Barbara has said, so you want to support your awakening and personal transformation with daily centering and wellness practices, meditation, prayer, walking in nature, exercise, massage, som somatic body centered therapy or personal process sessions with your BIP, um, energy healings. Now is the time to really clear 
um, what the material that you're working with, with inside of yourself, your psyche, and how do I support the change internally? There's a lot of suggestions here, and I'm not going to go through all of them um, due to out of the spirit of the interest of time, but it's all about working with your consciousness and bringing out of shadow the pieces that are either colluding with white fragility um, or have false beliefs that are limiting your next creation um, here on earth. And um, definitely continue to do and receive energy healings to support all of the healing that's needed, whether it's to clear the emotional blocks that are in the field, clear relational cords and traditional ancestral roots. Um, you also get to receive the healing responses for the wounding experiences that were held in your field. And how do I support the change interpersonally? First of all, most importantly, let's align our intention to see each person clearly and accurately. Open your heart and welcome all that's here. Learn about the other person's culture, values, needs, and unique challenges. Um, earn their trust and respect. We can't automatically assume they will trust us or respect us. So Whatever inside of you, your inner guidance for how can I build trust and respect in this relationship, follow that. You know, be trustworthy. Show you authentically care. And I don't mean that from a mask standpoint. I mean, be there. Fully be there. And authentically be there. Even in those places that are uncomfortable, it's more important to be there holding space for, let's say the other person, in this case, if you're a healer, um, you know, it's okay if you have a tear in your eye. This is such deep uh, territory we're walking with. It's okay to let them see the impact of their situation on you as long as that does not get in the way of the focus being on them. That's the really, really important that we hold that distinction as the healer. And so we're holding space for the emotional pain in their wound. We're transmitting the energy of the missing healing experience that happened during the wound. So maybe it's, you know, bringing up that feeling of safety within your own field and bringing that into the room with the other person, uh, bringing in that feeling of belonging and love and letting that transmit to the other person without any um, expectation or demand on them for them to receive it. You're just creating the environment where they can over time, you know, learn to receive that. And I learned this from uh, Ada. She just said, be with them, you know, holding their wholeness. Don't try to fix them. Just fully be there with them. And of course, she did this with all of her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren mirroring their essence. And that's a beautiful um, blessing that she's giving us by, you know, sharing that. And, and then work in your own personal process, your supervision in your healing sessions to clear any lower frequency energy in your relational cords with the person um, that on your end is impeding clear communication. You know, your responsibility is to work with your field, your body, your emotions, your thoughts, and to clear your side of the communication. And I'm just um, I'm not going to talk about these slides, but just to show you, there's a, a young girl with her parents and the relational cords, they connect at each of the through each of the chakras. And then the photo on, or the image on the right is Barbara working with the energetic cords with this gentleman's mother. And remember with energy, energy takes on the form of consciousness. I've worked on uh, a client's 
relational cord before and when i was clearing the cords it was like clearing barbed wire like ow 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 and it's not literally barbed wire but that's how prickly the relationship was and that symbol was coming through in the healing as we were starting to clear that energy and then healing relational cords with ancestors and this is a beautiful process nobody wants healing more for us than our ancestors and i won't go into the specifics of that healing but we do offer um, classes with regards to healing ancestral cords and i'm, I'm sure that we'll continue to do so and so how do I support the changing community? You know, take action to dismantle systems of racial injustice and oppression. Educate yourself. Um, step into your unique role within community groups aligned with similar vision and values as you to help establish you know, equal rights for all. And so this might sound a little Pollyanna, but I'm going to really encourage you to vote. That is one of the powerful systems that was created for us to affect change. We saw it happen with the last election. There were huge changes in decision-making bodies. Be active with your congressmen and your senators to let them know if they're going to represent you, these are the things that you want represented in our government. And with that, I close and we light a candle for transformation. And I hope that together with this powerful intention of millions of people all over the world, we'll be united to create lasting, sustainable change around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Such a such a beautiful presentation, Kathy, Ada, Lisa, uh, all of you. Thank you for your deep sharing, your observations, your inspired teachings about how we must continue to care for ourselves and for each other. Um, thank you. Who our next presenter is Kai Scott. Uh, Kai is a former faculty member at BBSH, having taught on both the sophomore and senior years. He holds a BA in English education from the University of Maryland, focusing his study on multicultural education and African American literature. He completed his master's course at Florida University in Gender and Sexuality. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, Patricia. <clears throat> uh, I'm mindful of the time. It's been almost an hour and a half. And so I really invite everyone to do self-care in, in whatever way you need to, stretching the toes. I always like self-massage. Make sure you're staying in your body. <clears throat> Water, whatever you need to do to, to be present. Uh, um, I really would love to have lots of time for questions. I want, and uh, Harun is so good about teaching off of the moment organically. I would like to not take up much time. So much of what uh, I've been exploring has been covered, so I don't want to repeat. Uh, but in honor of <clears throat> Patricia's vision and her um, very beautiful uh, merging of intention and heart in her question about what, how does systemic racism show up in the field? I do wanna just touch on a couple of quick things and then I'll yield the floor. Um, for the white clients that I've worked on recently who've come asking for a support in clearing this, the biggest um, piece that I've noticed is the nodding of ancestral, traditional ancestral roots through the crown and sixth chakra. Uh, Kathy touched on that and showed some pictures. And rather than getting into the anatomy and physiology of 
what the chakra system looks like when those roots come in. Wanted to ask Randall to just um, put up a photo that I gave of the little baby with the KKK and just be in your body and, and feel this. And while he's finding, I just call it <clears throat> old school. There you go. Thank you. So notice the infant arriving on the earth, innocent, and the community in which she is born and the influence that's going to have on her. Just take a moment and feel into that. And Randall, if you can put up the next one of the little older child in the same situation. So as you're, as you're looking at these, think about your own family system that you were born into. <clears throat> what distorted beliefs were taught to you through your community, religion, government, and what blind spots has that given you? Kai, I don't have another picture of a yeah, slide. Okay, then you can just take that down. Thank you. So you, in, in the, in the, in this moment, these the, the parental cords come in and enter and begin to demand and manipulate the child's intelligence and the spiritual perspective to conform to their belief system that serves. And it inhibits the child from growing up connected to spirit and true vision. And so I just put out as one thing for, well, ev everybody to, to look at that, but particularly white healers to do the behind the scenes work with your BIPs and healers to look at your family history and think about how that, ha that can get in your way of working well with black clients that need presence and support. The two childhood memories that I have with my family. So, you know, this is so obvious to most people, the distortion there. But that exact same thing can happen through <clears throat> very masked, appropriate Christian ways. I remember as a child when we crossed as a family over the bridge into Washington, D.C., hearing the sound of the door locking and not really knowing what that meant, but feeling this shock and fear in my body and then looking around and noticing that people that we were driving past were black and learning at church that white people were the ones that followed Christ in the, in the um, pre-existence before birth and black people were not clear which side they wanted to follow. And even though the little body, the little heart of my boy self felt something was off being raised in an environment where you're wired to believe and trust in your seniors, it creates blind spots. I don't know if you're interested, but I do have your images if you want me to share them from my screen. It's up to you. Uh, uh, maybe some of them. Thank you. Okay, yeah. I can hold them up. So that was just the one thing that I've been doing at uh, traditional ancestral root healings on white, uh, what happened there? white clients to help them start to be able to look more clearly at white privilege, white fragility, and start to strengthen their container. You can just turn that off. 
Yeah, that's, sorry about that. Um, I have it all here, and when I'm on my normal desktop, I can share it, but not now. I don't know why. Yeah, just turn it off. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's okay. So that's what's on the um, side of working with white clients. Um, and then I've done some work with two biracial uh, black females who had white, a white parent. And supporting this work with reconnecting with the ancestral cords has been um, really deep and powerful for them and seeing where they were completely disconnected from their white ancestors, where um, the sort of neediness of the egoic experience blocked them from getting support. Um, also, deepening the connection to black ancestors that are in the field to support the work because of a lot of the uh, tearing of families apart, the trauma that is created there. But the, the last thing that I want to focus on, because again, we spent a lot of time covering this material, is the ability to, to be present to the trauma that is in the field. Now, this has been a challenge because of the <clears throat> teachings that I was raised with, raised with in being colorblind. It's not appropriate to talk about race. Don't bring it up unless somebody else brings it up. And then that then makes me a weak healer, unable to hold the space that is needed to clear and ground and so I want to talk to the, the, what I was most touched by with uh, Ms. Ada Robinson's presentation on fear and looking at the fear within each of us. And I thank you, Ada, for staying in the conversation as long as you have with your patience and your love. You have been very healing for many people on both sides of the racial divide. So in looking at fear, the healing response that we're taught at school in the states of being, we want to hold a healing response for fear. The two chakras that we need to hold simultaneously are one and five. The fifth chakra, as you all know, has been deeply wounded with the I can't breathe, the knee on the neck. And that has been, ar been around in one form or another for 400 years. And it is important that we are able to not pass out with our white fragility, to not be afraid to name what we see in the energy field, especially on the astral level when we start to see imprints without speaking i want to just let you have a moment to breathe and notice what your ability is to stay in your body if you were to feel this in somebody's energy field Breathe and open your root chakra. See it. Feel it. Can you stay present to validate this? of astral fifth chakra stuff no accident so i'll just own own that <clears throat> on the fourth level of the field where so much collective trauma exists there are many objects you may find 
Can you stay present with your breath and your body? cannot create a field of safety and trust for ourselves or our clients if we don't know our fear. If we can't be with it and ground it, if we can't open our fifth chakra and have our breath or let our brothers and sisters who are black have that voice and their breath, we cannot create safety and trust. I want to show one last image because I have seen this in the energy field and been unable to name it. I've been unable to allow my own field be strong enough to clear the trauma. And I know it's possible. I ask as a group before I turn the time over to Haruna to spend one minute with this image and stay in your feet, in your breath, Collectively, I invite us to do the work that we need to so that we are a trusted space in the future. We are able to ground and bring breath and life to trauma so that it can move, so that life can flow Thank you for Patricia. Thank you, Patricia, for allowing me to be part of your vision. And I welcome questions when you feel ready to ask. Hi, I'm just doing this because you invited me to. Please, Ladine. Um, so before passing it to Haruna, I'm just um wondering if you could help um, just check in with, have people check in with themselves, you know, um, connect, just see what's here. Um, because I'm feeling your intention and I also don't want to now leave that in, in any way incomplete and move to Baruna, a black man. And you're doing it with, yeah, so stay with me if you will. You are making that invitation. The invitation is here. Let's not rush lynchings, which are still happening in another form, is not something to talk over. Just notice everybody, how present are you in your body? Don't get lost in shame or guilt, notice it and come back.
I welcome your wisdom too, Ladeen. Please feel free to stay unmuted. <clears throat> or not. On it as much as possible. Not that it necessarily has to be complete, um, but to give a little bit more time and space um, for you to um, continue to hold space, having entered the images into the space, and as a white person, supporting white people, and knowing that those images can have a different impact based on race and my just not wanting or my wanting it to be a little bit more people to have more time and space myself included because I didn't want Haruna to have to carry more. Thank you. And it is my intention to learn to be able to hold more. So to, to the white people, I will invite you, because this has been something I've struggled with, when, when the reality of this, right? This is not a, just a photo, this is a real man. This is a real man. It is so easy to feel the horror and the shame of your ancestors and how you have colluded to allow this to happen. This is George Floyd in another form. It is easy to apologize in a way that pushes the other away or makes them take care of you. So I'm going to just move behind and give you another chance to just breathe. Stay in your body and show up. Hi, uh, I wonder, um, mm. stay with your breath. <laughs> be some holding for us as well yes. yes it's time it's about time everybody who is present who is identified as white please stay present put your fragility on the shelf and ground into your body and your hearts and hold the container to listen and reflect
Very powerful, Kai. Thank you for doing this work and walking this walk with us. My elder, my sister, I see you. You're here. Do you have something? What came up for you, Ada? Well, I've seen that so many times on a human being because of my age and where I lived. So it doesn't matter how many times you've seen it. It's just, it keeps coming. It keeps happening in different forms. And when I see things like that, I see And it makes me really appreciate all of you that are on this, and especially the young Black sisters and brothers and the whites that get on the team. But it helps me to know that we have to keep fighting. I sometimes wonder. Why am I still doing this? I was I marched with Martin Luther King. I fought such battles. But when I see all of you working, and especially the young, I feel like they are taking the baton. And I see all of the whites that are filtering in, trying to learn. I can see that there's work to be done and there are people that's willing to do it. And it breaks my heart to see it because except by the grace of God, any one of my children, my sons, grandsons, great, great grandsons could be in these shoes if this isn't healed. So those come up for me. I just get ready to, uh, it solidifies for me that I'm in the right place at the right time. Because it's horrible to see someone bleeding because someone has beat them and destroyed their skin. That's what many people I've seen look like. I'm curious, Ada, because you so often hold space for others. You know, you get put in that space of being the matriarch. What do you need right now in this moment? If you got to go into your inner kid, little Ada, who has not been held, what do you need right now from the group? Right now, just to be present, just to be present, to see and feel and be supportive by being there. That's, that's all. You are seen and you are cherished and your support is immense. Thank immense. you cannot be replaced by anybody else on this faculty. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Um, I wanted to see if Haruna wanted to, to present um, or if it's even time to move on from this space. I, I don't quite know. I'll just, I'll introduce Haruna and if he would like to present, he may. And if he would like to yield the floor, um, he, may, he may also do that. Um, uh, Haruna, Haruna Suma, 
holds degrees in psychology, mental health counseling, as well as marriage, family, and couples therapy. Haruna is senior faculty and is currently dean of year four. Haruna. Thank you, Ada. You're welcome. Thank you, Patricia. Thanks, Kai and Kathy. So I taught a, um, I co-taught a relationship workshop this weekend with Donna Evan Strauss. And I thought it was an amazing workshop. It was an opportunity to teach skills that I think are necessary for us to understand each other. My focus is on communication. The biggest piece about communication is to be able to listen listen to what the other has to say without your judgments, free of having to fix it, and your justifications. So I'm gonna, I like to be authentic in, in the moment, as was stated. So I almost did not come back for this. I almost resigned from uh, BBSH after something that took place on Saturday. It was trauma traumatizing for me and I did not feel held, did not feel heard, and I felt the white fragility rearing its ugly head and the other not being able to be present to what I needed. What I realized after the call, because I left, I needed to take care of myself. I realized after the call that this moment took place in 2002 with the same people, the same group of people. I wasn't heard. I was actually invalidated and told that I was creating separation by bringing up something that had taken place um, with me. I think I shared this on the first day with my baby boy who was only six months old. And I brought that to advanced studies and I wasn't held. people vacated. And again, I was told that I was creating separation. So in that moment, when I shared that back in 2002, I shut down. I said, nope, I'm not gonna do this again. They can't share, they can't hold, are not willing to. But the optimist that I am, I did it again the next year with something else, another incident that took place. Pretty much the same reception. Different people, same reception. And I did it again the next year. And I've been doing this dance for a bit and believing that it's going to be better sharing my story with people who I consider to be friends and colleagues and allies and this piece happens. So then I start to wonder, what is it that I'm not doing? What am I doing wrong? So one of the questions is, how, do, how does racism show up in the human energy field or in the body. Well, imagine what I go through walking down the street 
and a white woman is walking towards me and she clutches her handbag, pulls it in. Or when I get into an elevator and a white woman steps on the elevator and I pull my chakras and especially my second chakra so that it doesn't appear that I have any sexual energy going towards that person. Because what we understand in this country is if a white woman says something about a, a black man, that's a death sentence. Even if it's in jest, it's a death sentence. So if someone says, oh, well, Haruna, you know, you can be like that sometimes. And it's in a group of other white people, the damage is done. Because they start to wonder, what does that mean? What does it mean that he can have his moments? So then I can't be authentic. I shut down. I'm not allowed to be me. So my energy field is pulled in. I become present to the other and I begin to take care of the other. Forget about my needs. So I found myself willing to teach, to educate my colleagues on their white fragility or their supremacy one more time. Same result. And I said, you know what, fuck this, I've had enough. There's always a fear for black people that if we stand up, we'll get fired, we'll be laid off. Somehow there's gonna be a justification. There's, oh, he's angry, she's angry. Oh, that's a troublemaker. And back in the days of Jim Crow and slavery, oh, he's an uppity. It's one of those uppity ones. Got to put them in their place. As evidenced by the scars on the man's back that shot Kai showed. Or if there's an advance towards somebody of a different race, and the police are called immediately. I remember a few years ago, a football player was on the sidelines and he was very dramatic. His name is Des Bryant, black man, very dramatic. And he was in the faces of his teammates and his coaches. And the reporters in the booth were saying, well, look at him, look at what he's doing. That's uncalled for, he's disrespectful. We don't need that in football, American football, for those of you who are European. <laughs> I apologize. So, yeah, we don't need that, that's a bad look. He's not a team player. On that day, this man, had a microphone, he was mic'd. So everything that he said was being recorded. And what he was saying, guys, let's do this. That team doesn't deserve to be on the field with us. We can do this, let's come together, we can beat them. Come on, come on guys, we can do it. But the white commentator saw this demonstrative person and vilified him. He's not a team player. He's angry. So then we have to pull our energy back in. Can't be too demonstrative because someone might think something of us. So the rigid characterology comes out and your hands are in your lap. 
nodding your head, going along with things that you don't agree with. Part of educating people who are white or non-black or non-person of color is to say, I don't want to do something. Well, I want you to do this because I want all races to be represented. And this is an African piece. This is Swahili. I don't speak Swahili. I don't know anything about Swahili. I'm from Guinea. Africa is a continent. Guinea is a country. Kenya is a country. Nigeria, Nigeria is a country. There are many, many ethnicities. We're not all the fucking same. So I don't want to do something because you want me to do it. And I should have the right to say no. But I'm afraid if I don't, I'm not a team player. I'll be judged. And that person I don't want to educate in the moment because I said no, that should be enough. We're not all the same. Not every black person is the same. And the scary thing is we all might be. We don't know where we come from. Amen. So at some point I talked to Patricia, I'm gonna have a time to talk about the African continent and the ethnicities and the different groups of people who built this country and the talents and art that we brought to this country and that we bring to the world. I think Chuck Cogliano is on the, on the call. He's a drummer. He's been to my country. My country is known for making the best drums in the world, the Tom Tom. And people from all over the planet go to Guinea to have their drums, to make mm -hmm. their drums. Dean Ramsden was the first person I ever met who was Caucasian. He had a drum from Guinea. And we talked about that when I was a year two student. And he started to understand the culture. He asked me questions and I thought, oh, wow, that's great. He's interested. He's willing to learn from me. Not everybody is willing to do that, or they say they are. And when you call them on something, oh, no, no, it's not about that. No, no, I do this. No, no, I'm not racist. I have black friends. I was married to a black person. Well, my wife's white, and I call her on her white fragility all the time. Sometimes she misses it. Just because you have a white friend or you're married to somebody who's white doesn't mean that you're not racist. You That's have to right. be actively anti-racist. Which means after this call, figure out how you're holding race racism and what you're willing to do to change it. Because I'm tired. I'm really tired. I'm exhausted. I don't like walking to an elevator and having to say, no, I'll take the next one. You go ahead. Or somebody going to the corner. I don't like that. Or going to my colleagues and saying, this is what I need. And them justify why they can't do it. Instead of saying, hey, I'm here. I don't know how to do it. I'm going to make mistakes. And I'm here. If I get it wrong, hey, are you willing to call me on it and support me so that I can start to get it right? See, owning those pieces is the most important because we all get overt racism. We all get that. The covert racism is the most painful to me and I think to my friends as well. That's the piece that stings and lasts for a long time and makes me shut down 
or get loud and say, hey, enough is enough. That's what I'm gonna do for my kids. And hopefully when my grandkids come around, they won't have this issue. And I'm not there yet. So I wanna open it up to questions. Thank you, Haruna. Thank you for sharing. Thanks. Thanks to all of you on the panel. Aruna, being one of the people that was on our panel, that was part of Saturday, that was so painful. Um, I, I have the intention to do a repair in my connection with you. And it may not happen here, but I want you to know that um, that's my intention. Uh, my relationship with you is very valuable. And I deeply respect you. You have been my teacher, and I'm sorry I haven't reciprocated in the love and support that I've offered you. And it's your strong, clear voice uh, that makes you one of the best faculty members, if not the best, at our school. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my part in uh, making it so hard and exhausting. And I do love and care about you very deeply. And I hope I can show up more fully and in a deep and strong way to support you. And so in the same way that Kai had asked Ada in this forum, is there anything that you need? We're here to listen and to see. And to hold and support. Uh. It feels like it's too soon. Thank you. So I'd really like to open up to, if, you know, the audience, if possible. I think uh, someone raised their hand or two people had their hands up. Okay. Thank you. Christina. Hey, thanks. Um, I'm Christina. I just graduated ASBW this year. So I was feeling a type of way during this session. And it was pretty different than the way I felt during the first session. Unfortunately, I missed last week's. Um, so I just wanted to explore that a little bit. So it felt like I took some notes throughout, so I'm, I might read off of it. 
uh, so it felt like um, in some of the shares, there was uh, this focus on how racism affects black people and the, their energy field. And what we can do to support them. Now, I've been, I've noticed Shalamaya actually, I don't know if you're here, but she uh, pointed out some of my white saviorism to me recently. So I've been really looking at that and, and trying to find it around me as well. And I guess when I come to this panel, I hope to see um, accountability and examples and um, investigate how whiteness shows up within white supremacy. And uh, it feels like we're trying to find a solution to a problem that we aren't really um, looking at in the moment. So I, I'm activated right now about it. I can name them. I'm, I'm feeling a little bit scattered. I guess what I would really love to know more about and to talk about during these sessions is how, which Haruna actually mentioned, um, and Kathy also, you mentioned it when you said, uh, you talked about the impact on the Hara line, the impact of white fragility and how then what happens is that we collude with white supremacy. So that's what I'm curious about. Like, I wanna know how, how we can stop um, our white fragility, how we can really take a look at these things in the moment within our community and in, in a minute to minute uh, kind of way rather than seeing the problem as outside of us or like within the US or North America, like I see it here, like within this structure even. And so, you know, that's what I want to talk about. It feels like the avoidance of that is white fragility in action right here, right now, um, which is frustrating. I would imagine, yeah, anyway, it's frustrating for me. Uh, Yeah, so whereas I, I'm finding this undertone of question of like, what do we need to do for black people to be okay? And the question that I have is, what do we need to do as white people? What do I need to do in order to dismantle white supremacy, not save anybody else or, or, or you know, be the savior of a situation, but really take a look at where it still lives within me. I remember in the first session, Haruna asked the question of, um, isn't it amazing how well-spoken this panel is? And I had such a, it, it was such a journey that I went on with that question because I thought, yeah, it's a, yeah, they're well-spoken, amazing. And then I stopped and was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, where is that, where is that coming from? And as we unpack that, like that to me felt um, so important to see. And the discomfort that I felt of like, oh, fuck, like I said yes to that in my head. Now I can look at my, my unconsciousness from before and make it more conscious. Anyway, I feel like I'm rambling now and I'm going off topic, but I just wanted to name that um, discomfort that I was feeling and also the discomfort that I felt. And again, if this is not the experience of the people of color and the black people on this panel, um, please do correct me. And maybe you guys had an agreement prior, but seeing those images um, being being put on the screen without any warning or um and then again you know after ladine spoke i interpreted that as a moment to just give some space because that was so jarring and you know it's a very different experience to see that as a white person than it would be um a black person saying that and i i felt uncomfortable with that um not in seeing the images themselves. I think that's important for us white people to see, but just the lack of sensitivity around the fact that there are black people in the audience. Um, just felt a bit shocking. 
And uh, yeah, I guess. I guess that's all. Thanks for listening. I know that's kind of all over the place. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. Hermeline, next. Uh, Haruna, is it okay if I just speak to Christina's question a little bit, or does that feel off the wave? Um, I don't know. No. No, it doesn't <laughs> feel off the wave. Okay. Yes, it does feel off the wave. Oh, thank you. Thank you thank for you. your clarity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And really, let me just clarify that. It feels off the wave to me because my experience is, and my sense is, although this may not be true, that when something is shared, like Chris just shared, there can be a discomfort and from white people in my experience, they want to explain something. And, yes. it, and that enables fragility. What builds your capacity is sitting with the discomfort and not being able to fix it, to explain it. It is tolerating the discomfort and the more you, I sit with the discomfort, the greater my capacity is to tolerate it without going to fix or do. I can be with and allow that and stay in my experience. Amen. Thank you. Aho. That's right. Um, Am I next? Yes. So my name is Hermelijn. I'm from the Netherlands, uh, from Amsterdam. Uh, Haruna was my teacher in the third year um, in Europe. So what I'm noticing at the moment is a lot of fear. So by seeing the pictures and also in listening to your story and uh, pain. Um, so I really want to honor your, your strength and authenticity and sensuality. and the way that you were there at school and still are, that really speaks to me. So I was also, also thinking about what is it in me or where can I find those places? because Amsterdam is quite different from the United States. So it's sometimes hard to relate in a way. But I remember one time when, it was a long time ago, but I tried to remember those moments where I was like off and being racist. So I re remember one time there was an African man and I lived in a, in a very mixed neighborhood. And there was an African man who was uh, picking flowers or, or plants. And I really was like judging him that he was picking them. So I came on to him quite harsh and judging him. 
so I asked him, what are you doing? But, you know, not from a place of interest or curiosity, but more like from that he was doing something wrong. So then he said he was uh, picking those plants for their healing properties. So that really, you know, shocked me in a way that, you know, me being so in my white supremacy or whatever you call it. And coming forward in a way that was, well, way before I became interested in healing. And then one other time I went to uh, uh, South Africa, no, South America, to Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And there was a moment where I went with my boyfriend and we went into the forest and, and we paid quite a lot of money to, to go there with a guide. And he showed us around. And on the second day, maybe, they told us that the money was uh, gone because they had to pay way more, they said, than they used to. So I was furious. Of course, I had more than enough money. And of course, they were very poor. And I don't know what came into me, but I was so angry because my I, I felt that my money was like stolen or taken from me or... So I... Well, I didn't do it myself. That might be the most more, more uh, uh, courageous to do, but I fa uh, forced my boyfriend to have this man pay us back. So this man has to go over the market to find someone that could lend him, him the money. So of course they were not black, but they were in a in a in a totally different situation than we were like white and privileged and with a lot of money and coming there for our holidays and you know being entertained and then i i did this until the day till this day i feel really ashamed of doing these kind of things. I mean, it's not like very often, but this was, this was the most clear example to me of being a racist or feeling, you know, entitled, entitled to do something like that. Yeah. So that's what I hear the most, that you feel as a white person entitled to do something because you are raised that way that you are superior or just entitled because you are in a place of power so um, yeah so that's what i wanted to share just to you know, share something from my side. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Krista. Oh, on mute. There we go. <laughs> Good. Um, I am so, um, I feel honored to be here. And um, I just wanted to share, um, I don't have a question for the group right now. Um, I just wanted to say how, how much I've gotten. And I just want to thank all of you, all of you, all of you. And um, 
kind of wish I was still teaching there. So I taught for three years at Barbara Brennan School, 94 to 97, started in 1990. And um, um, during my sophomore year at home, I was dating a black man and I had already been doing um, uh, anti-racism work uh, starting starting officially in 1980 at, in D.C. Um, um, and I realized during that relationship just how racist I was, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I'm really thankful for that because I... I don't want to be racist. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I want, I want to honor everybody and I want to be honored. And I want, I want, <laughs> I want healing to happen. And I really appreciate just this forum. And I think it's very wonderful that we're all here, um, that y'all are here. And, um, I totally appreciate Haruna what you're saying. I totally, I totally appreciate you. I know I can't totally understand it because I'm not you, but like that whole that whole thing, like Ladine was saying, of like just sitting with the uncomfortableness. That's it. It's hard. It's hard. Um, but I can choose to go in and out of it. You know, I can choose to ignore it because I can, I can pass, you know, not everybody can. So thank you all. Thanks. Hi from Atlanta. It's really hot here. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I am Marion Marion from France. Um, today I want to present my experience um, because since we started this healing racism divide, like this is the first time I have such a strong action in my system. Um, I didn't like it today. I really appreciate the first two sessions. And for almost two, the two entire hours, I felt anger, discomfort, confusion. I was hearing bullshit, bullshit, bullshit in my head. And I don't feel good right now. And I am angry. <sighs> and I learn that when I am angry, it's because something really matters to me. And this subject, racism, matters to me. BBSH school matters to me. The US matters to me for personal reason. And what I've been shared today uh, didn't feel right. Um, we're talking about like systemic racism and I believe we are all aware that BBSH is a system by itself. And all I have witnessed today is avoidance. Um, and by saying this, I'm talking directly to the faculty 
the current one, the former faculty, I feel like you are, I have to say, thank you for doing this first. Thank you for doing this. I don't want to diminish the efforts for putting all these things together. But still, you have a huge responsibility as teachers, as a faculty, and all I can trust in teachers are the ones who lead by example. And today, you didn't show me the example. And today, I want to follow you. But I will come back next time. Because I believe, I believe we can make it. And as Christina said earlier, what I'm expecting in this story is to talking about what is real. I don't want to use energy work to hide. I want to talk about what is happening for real at school, between us. What are the action we're taking? When are we staying silent? I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you as models. And I'm still waiting for proof that you really want to tackle this issue for real at BBSH. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Marion. Julie Murray. Thank you, Haruna. I want to thank all of you that are responsible for creating, co-creating this healing series. I've been to all three of them and hope to be at the next two and cannot imagine receiving a greater gift than your willingness to be in relationship with each other. I'm assuming to the best of your ability being in the cauldron of your truth. And I've been stunned by the wisdom and the courage that I have presence today here. Aruna, especially you and Nadine stepping forward and speaking in this moment the truth of your experience. And in my years, I taught at the school for, from 1994 until 2005. And what I hear you talking about today, without my knowing any details, is the dynamic of the right use of power or the wrong use of power. And one way I've experienced my own racism is the misuse of power based on my assumptions about a person because of the color of their skin or the whatever. So I thank you so much for being so honest and bringing forward the real issue that all of us have to deal with. And it has to do 
with our relationship with power as that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't know how much time we have. So, oh, Patricia, and I see a few hands are still up. Well, we're supposed to end at 2.30 today. We've already gone over. Um, maybe we should, maybe we should close for today. Uh, what do you think, team? Uh, the plan was to end at 2.30. Should we go ahead and honor that and your time? Should I? Maybe for the questions that are existing, how many are left? It's five or six. Oh, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, technically, how long is the space open? But then two, maybe people can leave if they need to leave um, to honor the time and people who stay can stay. But then I'm not sure of the impact of that on the container. That's my, that those are my only contributions. Um, well, let me just go ahead and just thank, um, and then we can decide after. I just wanna thank Ada and Lisa and Kathy and Kai and Haruna. Um, Thank you for this walk and for doing it as graciously as you can. And um, I love, I love you. Uh, Nadine, thank you for stepping in. If, if those of you who need to go, um, uh, please do so. And thank you for joining us. And I hope to see you next week. And um, those of you who would like to stay, um, maybe we can have a few more comments or questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm unmuted. I'm Kelly. I can speak. Okay, Kelly. Thanks. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge my fear <laughs> at first of speaking um in this moment in this space just because i'm just feeling so sensitive um because i'm white and i'm afraid there's a part of me that's afraid of saying the wrong thing um but i want to just align with my heart and my spirit which is where i want to speak to you all from and with you. Um, just a couple of things. One is that I want to speak the larger vision of healing also, not to rush there at all. Um, I absolutely want to be present with holding all in the black community here in this space in the larger one and to 
be with you in my love um, as we acknowledge all the pain that has happened collectively and personally. So I absolutely do not want to diminish that at all, at all. And also I want to speak the part about how we also need to hold the high watch for each other in terms of larger spiritual vision. Um, meaning it, it can be very tempting to, um, well, we can go into helplessness easily in, in the face of such large cultural factors and that was, has been spoken to in these last three meetings. And um, I would love for us to hold that this pain that we're feeling with and being with absolutely does not have to be the, the end of the process. Um, I guess es essentially I'm speaking to that spiritual principle of that our spirits can become, our soul systems can become so clear in our healing process and purification process that the outer circumstances do not have to rule how we feel. And I know spirit has told me that in my process over the years, but you are not asked to suffer. You are not asked to suffer. Um, you are asked to become aware and clear the fear that is in the pain within you so that you can embody and completely feel the union with spirit and that peace. So um, I wanted to bring that into you. And one other piece about when we were talking about the energy field correlations to racism. Um, the other thing that I'm seeing, I don't think that the Crown Center was mentioned much. I had to leave briefly, but I don't think this is a duplication that um, similar to what Lisa said earlier, I do feel like, yeah, all of the energy centers can get involved here with taking on pain with such incredible long-term oppression. Um, and in terms of like pathwork and main images and main dualistic beliefs, I wanted to share that it feels to me like primary places, primary energy centers to start. Um, feel to me like the crown and the heart and both on the victimizer side and uh, um, the victimized side. It's like with the victimizer side that's like the heart. Okay, in relationship, I don't see the oneness that we are. So the, both of these places, the heart and the crown are have primary disturbances to me. And then on the other side, with the victimized side, it also feels primarily crown and heart to me and that it's the, the experience of reality of relationship is not about that inclusive love and divine love. Um, so I wanted to share that perspective. And um, I think when those, I think the solar plexus feels to me like it's a, like a, a close second to those two. Um, but it feels like when those main beliefs are healed and unified, that then the disturbances with the other energy centers um, will have an easier time with, with healing and resolving and clearing. So.
Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I have to go, everyone. So um, thank you so much for holding space for us. And oh, present. please don't go yet, Haruna. I have a question for you. Who is? Joseph Cohn. Oh, OK. Hello. Aloha from Maui. I actually have a question. Yes. Uh, I actually have two questions. The, the first is, how do I get over my, how do I get over my resistance? Can you hear me all right? Yes. Hello? Okay. How do I get over my resistance to keep up the fight to dismantle white supremacy when all I want to do is just like ignore all of this because, because, because I can. So how do I resist the urge to bail because it's so damn frustrating. And the, the, another question is, the second question is, how do you or any other person of color on this call feel about uh, white people not even being able to come up with a damn question for you? And just sharing their own distress. Both great questions. <laughs> <laughs> So the first I'm learning the first question <laughs> I'm gonna let um, the white people address because I think that that's um, who should be addressing that and the second question I'll address um, it is a little disturbing that I'm not receiving more questions or or Ladine's not receiving more questions or Ada is not receiving more questions so I, I'm curious about that myself and I'm gonna continue to explore what that is as a fear? I don't know. I don't know. But I think I thank you for that question. It's it's a really good one. It's one that I've been sitting with. Yeah. So the thank other you. question, first question for sure. If there's time, um, if someone wants to respond, I, I think that that would be great. Thank you, Aruna. And thank you everyone for doing the work this is the beginning <laughs> amen yes yes i wish i could snap my fingers and make it go away i wish everyone had the privileges that i have and that's not the case yet thank you i think christina wants to respond to your first question yeah i can respond to that question then i also had a question for you guys um that I was actually holding back because I know I spoke already. So maybe I can, I can name it. Um, okay, so I've been asking myself the same question. Um, and what I realized is that we, uh, we do this work, like we, we've been to BBSH for, six, for four years, right? And plus many of us for many more years, we do this work in our lives constantly. We're unpacking our own trauma and our own stuff and how do we communicate better and how do I get my needs met by my family better? How can I do this better? How can I unpack that? And we do that forever and we're aware that that's going to be a forever thing. As long as we're a human being alive, we've, we're on the path now, we're doing it. It started like it's, it's going. And when I realized that anti-racism work is the same, um, there, it wasn't so much about an end goal or how do I, you know, achieve a certain, get to a certain point. And so realizing that it's gonna, that it's, a, it's constant and it's forever allowed me to take some breaks and just tend to like self care every once in a while and not get so um, fixated to the point where then I burn myself out and I can't do anything. And that's the same like that I've noticed in any work that we do, even in at BBSH, when I get so into, when I was getting so into my DLMs and dissecting everything that I was doing, I was becoming exhausted. When I realized, okay, hold on, your whole life is gonna basically become a DLM, like I it was able to uh, turn it into a much more sustainable thing. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's helpful at all, but I will say that my question Haruna's gone, but 
possibly Dean and Ada and any, if there are any other black students or alumni that want to answer. Um, I noticed that you guys kind of left for some moments. And so I'd like to know how today's panel landed with you and how you're feeling right now. Um, and maybe if you feel comfortable sharing uh, why you left for those moments, what was going on for you and um, yeah. Well, I'll share and I'll, I'll um, be as brief as possible. Brevity is not my strength, as you all know from the first session. Um, but I feel like there's a lot as I've been listening here. Um, and so there's, uh, Chris, when you initially were speaking, talking about not colluding and white saviorism, um, looking in the moment. So for me, I'm wondering about the parameters for the space being um, clarified because it wasn't my expectation that I would be asked questions, although I'm okay with that, but that wasn't my expectation when I entered the space today. And frankly, after the first session, I wasn't sure I would come to the second because it seemed like it was more for white people than for people of color. And that's okay because there are appropriate racially homogenous spaces for certain, you know, development to occur. Um, and so I think maybe the parameters just need to be clarified because I feel like we've, we've gone between this asking questions and also calling for white people as you did and as Sister Melody did session one, she wanted to hear white people's racism because that is more challenging when white people actually speak to how they have been perpetuators in a very specific way because the point is to be able to be with that which I desperately don't want to be with, right? Okay. Um, so I feel like that's happening for me. I think the other thing, I just have some questions. So in terms of me not colluding then, um, and the call for teachers or panelists to model as if teachers are perfect, which they're not, but I also understand the call because I'm looking for an example looking for examples. Um, and so if I'm going to offer my example in this moment, not as an exemplar, but just as me and not colluding, it would have been saying to Kathy, why not do the repair now or already have done it? Like ask Karuna if he wants the repair now because that puts you in a more vulnerable space. But there was the not going to do that. I'll do that later. And I appreciate you. And that's okay, but that's, that's not the, the most challenging muscle building route. Um, I even think the gentleman who just went, I think you said you were from Maui or Hawaii somewhere. I resonate with that. <laughs> and I thought to myself, and this is, I'm really coming from a space of much of, I, I can of love and not colluding, not allowing my silence, right? Okay. And I'm not in charge. <laughs> That's the other thing. Um, so, Haruna said he needed to go. And then the white male says, but I have a, I have a question. Haruna needs to go. Right. So that is the centering 
of the white person. That is not anti-racist. That is you, the centering of you, the centering of your need, and you're not bad because you did it. Don't go there. Just be aware that everything, not everything, so much in your socialization causes you to do that. White and male is a lot of privilege. And you don't even recognize when and how you're enacting that. And then it became, oh, but I have two questions. So it went from one question to two questions. So for me, I'm just thinking, didn't Haruna say he had to go? And I don't want to continue to, to, I don't want to come off as I'm taking care of Karuna because <laughs> Haruna can take care of himself. And I'm also just naming, so I'm not colluding and might be able to be a different example than what the young lady experienced. And I understand that was your experience, not necessarily mine. Um, but our experiences are valid. And not to mention Haruna is dealing with the latest incident in his BBSH experience. So that's multi-layered, see? So if anything, I'm gonna give him light duty today <laughs> because this is what he's dealing with. I'm not gonna push him to do more for me how do I give him cover? And so I think um, maybe the last thing I'll share is when Krista, you were talking about, I don't wanna be racist. I mean, I haven't met too many people who do, <laughs> you know. Um, and for me, as I'm working with white people, it is kind of like manage thy expectations. Like I, as a black woman, have internalized racism and I enact that, period, period. I'm not bad because I do it. I am a product of my socialization. And I need to get over the fact that I enact racism. White people need to get over the fact that they are by definition racist. That's the definition, you hold power. So whether you personally mediate racism or not, you are the, you are the benefit, benefactor, the beneficiaries of a racist system, okay? And so for me, it is getting beyond, oh, I'm afraid to be racist. I don't want to speak. I don't want to whatever. I don't want to do the wrong thing. I don't want to offend. Look, it's going to happen. And the only way to grow in your ability to act in anti-racist ways is to practice. To mess up, to get feedback, to be open to feedback, and keep it moving. That's why Black people and many people of color are so freaking strong. We got a lot of practice. Right. Okay? That's why Haruna can tolerate ask, answering the questions with grace, even though he said he had to go. That's why we can look at images, as Ada said, how many times have I seen this image, and not fall on the floor. And when we do fall on the floor, we keep going. That's right. You don't even know we fell. Right? Patricia's holding, can created this whole thing. She's in tears, but she's still going to fucking facilitate. That's Black people. Word, baby. And that's the capacity that is grown in my experience from the trial, from the test. And so, this is like with white people, you got to go through the test and the trial to build the capacity. And so that's what this is about. That's what this is about. 
So when I heard you say, Krista, you know, to Haruna, I don't understand because um, I'm not you and I can choose to ignore it. Great. Mm. Excellent. Because there's an understanding that you want to understand, but you never can fully because you're not him. You're not Ada. You're not Patricia. But you seek to understand as much as you can and ask, what do you need? And you meet that need as opposed to your needs being centered because white people's needs are always centered. That's the nature of racism. So that's what I have right now. Thank and you, ma'am. And it's Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think this thing goes off at three. So <laughs> it's, a, it's supposed to be. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ladine. Yeah, Ladine, Thank you have a very important voice here. And even though you are not official faculty, you clearly are. Thank you. Um, we got a spot in AS Ed next year or at the <laughs> No. You can come back. <laughs> I'll receive that. And there's that part of me that's like, I don't be seeing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> People are like, I saw this, I saw that. I didn't see that. <laughs> but thank you and good night. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Thank you, lady. Good night. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye.